All right, we're live on YouTube. We're live on Zoom. All right, good afternoon. I want to welcome you all to the SJSU Lurie College of Education Winter Webinar Series. My name is Erin Scullion Jones. I'm a faculty lecturer and supervisor here at SJSU. And it is my pleasure to introduce Jen Roberts, high school English teacher and adjunct faculty at the University of San Diego with her presentation titled writing instruction and feedback for the digital equity for digital equity excuse me and here is brian with a few announcements before we get started with jen and you're welcome to we would love it if you would um, drop your name where are you from in the chat and welcome can't hear you yet, Brian. Sorry about that. So I, I'll, I'll go ahead and let everyone know. So here's some announcements. I, um, oh, got it. A recording of this event will be available afterward at sjsu.edu slash education k12 academy. Uh, captions will be available in the recording. Attendees videos and audio, so your audio and video are automatically turned off. And um, please use the chat to communicate with one another and with us for questions. And definitely join our Facebook group and or LinkedIn. You can check out these links. They are in the chat. And... Without further ado, welcome. Hi, Jen. I'm always on mute. I work with ninth graders. Okay. Erin, um, is there a way you can spotlight my video so that it comes up bigger than you and Brian's? So right now I'm seeing all three kind of equally sized. It would help if mine was the biggest. Yeah. 
Let's see if we can make that work. There we go. All right. So hi, welcome to Writing Instruction and Feedback for Digital Equity. I am Jen Roberts. Uh, let me introduce myself a little bit. Um, I am a ninth grade English teacher. I that was my day. That is my day job. I was working with ninth graders half an hour ago, um, and all morning. So if you are just joining us and you are fresh from the classroom today yourself, thank you so much for joining us on a Friday afternoon. My blog is litandtech.com, and my Twitter is at Jen Roberts One. Please don't forget the one. Um, and uh, a little bit about myself. I'm a National Board Certified Teacher. I'm a Google for Education Certified Innovator. Um, my book is Power Up, Making the Shift to One-to-One -one Teaching and Learning. I have had one-to-one -one laptops in my classroom for my students since 2008, which now seems like a very long time ago. We've been using those Google tools that entire time. All right. Uh, this is the reality of my day. I live on Canvas and Zoom, much like many of you probably. Um, or Google Classroom, or Schoology, or Edmodo, or wherever you are. Um, that is where I am as well, but mostly for me it is Zoom. Um, and there, there's our, our cohort, a uh, little bit of reality. Um, I have a very privileged position in that I, uh, I serve a lot of students who have IEPs, and so I work with an amazing co-teacher, that's Miss Danielle Love-Hayes. Um, this quarter, we've also been blessed with a fantastic student teacher from the University of San Diego, this Allison Romansky. Um, and so if I use the, um, the we in this presentation, I am not making myself royal. It is because I work with a fantastic team. So when I say we did something, it's all three of us. And much of the work you're about to see is actually credited to uh, Ms. Romansky, who's been doing the bulk of our teaching this quarter as part of her student teaching. So she's been creating many of our materials in consultation with myself, of course. Um, and you're also gonna see a blend of some curriculum that the district gave us, and some things we created and modified ourselves. And as usual, teaching is always a collaborative process. So this is my other desktop. Um, I typically work with around three screens going on and one day one of my screens looked like this and I'm like, I have to take a screenshot of that because that's the kind of chaos that online virtual teaching really is. Um, that is the reality of where we are. That's my attendance, some breakout rooms I was about to launch spreadsheet I was tracking, text messages from my colleagues, direct messages in the chat from Zoom. It was all going on at the same time. I'm sure you can relate. Yes, exactly. Um, by the time we're done today, your screen may look like this. I'm going to tell you about a lot of things. You're going to want to open a lot of tabs. Uh, please don't panic. I have a resource doc for you that I will share uh, that has links to everything I'm going to talk about. So everything I'm going to talk about is going to be linked for you in one document at the end. So don't panic if you miss a link or you don't catch a uh, URL. All right. Um, some of you might have noticed that my head is in the corner and um, you're not watching, you're not technically watching a shared Zoom screen. You're actually watching my Zoom feed. I'm using something called the mm -hmm app. Uh, it's new this year, invented during the pandemic. It currently only works on Macs. Um, but uh, if you have a Mac, I highly recommend it. It's been a great way of teaching. I use it every day. Um, it allows me to have different rooms and different setups with different slide configurations and things like that to uh, keep me organized. And I really enjoy that one. So if you have a Mac, they have a, it is not free, but it is a, um, they have a free option for teachers. So once you download it and install it on your computer, if you email them and let them know you're an educator, they'll give you a free license for a year. All right, let's talk about teaching writing. That's what we're here for. All right, so we're gonna try Pear Deck today. This is joinpd.com and I'm going to drop you a link to it and a code. So there is a code on my screen, L-I-N-S-U-R, but I'm also gonna drop it in the chat. Clicking that should take you there. This will allow you to join me on my slides, answer questions for me in real time, participate kind of the way my ninth graders do in class sometimes and get a better sense of how writing instruction works in my class. Because we do, we have been using a lot of Pear Deck uh, in writing instruction this quarter. And I wanna give you a sense of that. So we have nine of you connected already. That's fantastic. Look at y'all, look at y'all going. I got a little counter right there. Right there, see, it's going up. Great, give you a second. All right, pull up my teacher dashboard. So that chat, that uh, code will stay in the chat. It's also always in the upper left-hand corner of my screen, sorry, upper right-hand corner of my screen there, L-I-N-S-U-R, in case you'd like to join later. But we've got 15 of you for now, and the link is in the chat if you'd like to join us. 
Um, if you're not ready to join us yet and you decide to join us later, you still can. All right, so where are you joining us from? I know many of you have been putting that in the chat. So maybe this is a redundant question. Perhaps we won't spend a lot of time on it. But um, for those of you who are on it, you've just experienced the, what happens when uh, the students see the slide on one side and the place for them to write their answer on the other. And the question I forgot to ask is how many of you have used Pear Deck before? So if you wanna add that to your answer, that would be the smart question to ask. Yeah. I noticed in the chat, lots of you joining from all over California and from Orange County um, and from Turlock. I know where Turlock is. In Fullerton, in Huntington Beach. And we have some San Diego folks. All right. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Okay, next question. A little easier. Oops, went too fast. Which level of students do you typically support? Excellent. So I'll show your responses that are behind my head here, but the, uh, the overwhelmingly we have folks here who are working with students in nine through 12. Um, we also have some middle school teachers and some elementary school folks. So hopefully all of this will be applicable to all of you at some level or another. Uh, move on from that. All right. And then here is a highlighting question. So at the bottom of your screen right now, there are colors. Um, and there are tools. And the second one from the left is the highlighter tool. If you switch to the highlighter tool, you can highlight. If you want to add your own, you can uh, switch to the text box and um, add a text box and type in your very own answer on that screen. All right. This is looking great. Oh, I love seeing this. All right, so I'm gonna show you how we use all of these tools in our classroom to help students understand writing expectations and learn more about writing structure and all the good things that they need to be doing right now. And of course, I am teaching entirely virtually. So this is this is my ace in the hole. My, my Pear Deck is, is what keeps us going and um, keeps us moving forward. All right. So first, let's make sure we all remember the writing process. Is everybody familiar with the writing process? It looks a little like this, right? Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so which of these characters would you say you identify with most at the moment? You can drag your little dot. There we go. You are all over the place. This is great. This is wonderful. Um, I'd like to point out something really cool that I learned in the last couple of weeks. MC Escher works are all under copyright, every single one of them. Um, and uh, But they have a fancy website where you can go and request copyright access. And so I filled out their form thinking, what the heck, maybe they'll let me use this picture. And within a week, they got back to me and said, yes, you can use our picture in your presentation. And I thought that was super cool. And I wanted to model that for you, that sometimes when you request copyright access to something, they actually say yes. And I thought that was neat. So for this one, they did that. Um, all right, I think of, now we all know that the writing process for students has lots of parts to it. When it comes to us, for, for us as teachers, I think of it as having three phases. I think of the instruction phase and the feedback phase and the assessment phase. And those are messy. We know that we're gonna move back and forth between those different modes at different times. But for the purposes of clarity here, I've kind of streamlined them into instruction feedback assessment. Um, we know it's not that nice and neat. It's never that nice and neat, um, but uh, it is always kind of like herding cats, but we're gonna try and move through those, that organization in this today. Um, so starting with, oh yes, they say, I say, have you heard of this book? Have you got this book? I'm curious, I wanted to know. Really helpful book. All right. I think if I put this up, if you're just joining us and you want to join us on Pear Deck, um, let me grab that link again. There we go. There's the link to join us on Pear Deck. 
Uh, they say, I say, okay, so seven of you have never heard of it. This is fantastic. Um, so allow me to give you a quick plug. This is a wonderful book for teaching academic writing. Um, and I'm gonna focus today on academic writing because I think it's the hardest one to teach. Um, I find it pretty easy to teach narrative. I find it pretty easy to even teach argument. What I find hard to teach is analysis. Um, and so I know analysis isn't exactly a se sexy topic for a Friday afternoon, um, but I think it's the one that's most uh, exemplary of what it takes to really teach writing, especially in a virtual environment. So that's the instruction we're gonna focus on today that analytical paragraph, because that's honestly what we've been teaching our students uh, this quarter. We started the quarter with a narrative that went pretty well, um, felt pretty natural to teach. And then we got into analytical paragraphs, which is more challenging. So let's start with the standards because we always start with the standards. These are the ninth grade literacy standards for claims and evidence. And I'll be perfectly honest with you, my students are not there. They're starting out more at the sixth grade level. So um, I have the wonderful job of moving them hopefully from the sixth grade level closer to the ninth grade level. Um, and obviously we're not ever gonna reach perfection with every single student all the time, but everybody moves. That's a, something Kelly Gallagher says. Um, if you're not a fan of Kelly Gallagher, get his books, they're wonderful. Um, everybody moves. So students may come to me sort of having an idea of what claims are, but usually they don't. We often start out by teaching them what claims are. Oops. Oops, if you're on the right screen again. All right, so on this page, you'll notice there is an embedded Google Doc. And this is step one is you have to teach students to annotate for analysis. They can't write analytically unless they have something to analyze. And in order for them to have something to analyze, they have to know how to analyze it in the first place. So this doc is live. Um, I happen to have it open here on another screen. And you'll notice if you're at the top and you notice you can scroll on this doc on that left right side, on, sorry, on the right side, you can scroll up and down on that doc. Um, if I start typing on it, and if you're at the top, you'll see me type on it in real time. Um, so this has been a great tool for working with students as well. We could demonstrate our analysis. Um, Ms. Romanski was key in this. This is actually her highlighting and her notes to herself as she went through this text with students and was able to show them the different claims, evidence, and tone words that were going on there in that document. So with the Google Doc embedded in Pear Deck, students can watch you annotate in real time. And it's a lot easier to not lose them because they're kind of a little bit held captive in your Pear Deck. So I hope you're getting to see that and it's working for you. Step two uh, is we have to teach students about reasoning. We, we taught claims, so we have to teach reasoning. We use this piece that came out of our district curriculum. It's a piece from Humans of New York about a mother and daughter, and they organize a birthday party for the daughter at a nursing home um, and, uh, and, how, and why this happened, right? So we read this little passage with the students and we introduce claims and evidence. So the claim, Heloise's mother cares about her. We provide several pieces of evidence and then we provide several pieces of reasoning. We want students to understand the relationship between those things. And then we show it to them again as a paragraph. So how does it go from this organization to this organization? We want them to see that relationship. Okay, so we've done some modeling and now it's time for them to try it. So we have a prompt to introduce. Um, this document is the prompt. This again was given to us by the district. It was what we started with. Um, they gave us two prompts that I'm gonna show you today. We invented two others to help our students um, master this task. Uh, this is the prompt and you have the full version of it in your doc that you can scroll up and down on. Um, we presented it to them in Canvas. Um, that was what the assignment page looked like. I know people like to know what other people's stuff looks like. That's what it looked like. Um, and I want you to notice this part down here at the bottom, which I'll make bigger. Um, is that we gave them a frame, a pretty hefty frame, a frame with a lot of support in it. Um, and that's a lot of what happens in that They Say, I Say book that I was telling you about before, is that the, the book is mostly frames, frames for writing in different formats. So we gave our students this frame so that they could use that to support their writing. We wanted to provide a tremendous amount of scaffolding um, so that our students would be feel successful with their first paragraph. 
And now students need a place to write. And this gets to a lot of the mechanics of how I um, sort of keep a one-to-one -one classroom rolling. This is a tool I use whether we are virtual or in person. They use one Google Doc all year long. And this doc behind my head is scrolling and you'll notice it's scrolling up from the bottom. And if you have a chance to see the dates, you'll notice that the newer work is on the top. So the older work is at the bottom, the newer work is on the top. This was something I came up with in 2008 actually, because my students were turning in Google Docs every single day. And that was a lot of Google Docs for them to turn in. And finally I went, whoa, we're just gonna keep using the same document for all of our smaller pieces of writing. So their uh, first analytical paragraph went into this Google Doc, where, um, a little tip about this uh, before we go there. Um, they put the newest work at the top, that's important. If possible, you try and put all their docs in one folder, teach them a naming convention like period, last name, first name. That way for me, it lines up also with the way they're configured in my grading system. And then we're gonna use preview to look through all of them quickly. Because I know if you've been teaching online for a while, and many of you have, that um, the challenging part of, of working with students in digital documents is you click the document and then you wait while it loads, right? Are you familiar with loading time? Oh, drives me crazy. So then they learned about preview. You click on one document, you click the eyeball, and now you can use the arrow keys right and left to flip through the student's documents as though they're a stack of paper. One document, eyeball, right and left arrow keys flip through the student docs. Now this is a pretty old GIF. This is actually from when I taught 11th graders, um, but uh, you get the idea. So if you have your students' documents all in one folder in Google Drive and you know how to use that preview button, you can see all of their student work very quickly and get a real sense right away of who needs you. And that button at the top that says open with Google Docs, when you come across one, you're like, oh, I need to leave that kid a comment. You open that one and move on and flip through the rest of them. And then by the time you're done flipping through all of them, you've got five or six open that you wanna leave some comments on. So preview, huge time saver. If you're not already using it, it's a great one to have. All right, uh, we talked about frames for students who need them. When we gave our students their first analytical paragraph, we gave everybody the frame. Everybody gets a frame and you get a frame and you get a frame and you get a frame, right? But a lot of the time we don't wanna give a frame to every single student, especially later on in the writing instruction process. We know we only wanna give those frames to certain students, um, students who have certain needs, students who have maybe needed them before, um, or students who just seem to be struggling in their writing. So the lovely thing about their English journal being a Google doc that, that we can access anytime is we can give them a frame anytime. And no one else has to know we did that. It's completely private, only the children, who, um, who chose or who, who we chose to give it to know that they have it. And a lot of times in the actual classroom, I'll open a student's document, drop in the frame, and then I'll watch the kid like, across the room like, Ooh. and all of a sudden the kid sees this frame appear in their doc and their eyes light up and they look up at me and they smile and then they give me a thumbs up and we're good to go, right? They're so happy. Um, because now they have something that's gonna support them and help them feel successful with what they're doing. All right. The other beautiful part about this doc is it allows for us to give very early feedback. Um, so this is a student, we're actually gonna see this student several times today. You can recognize her by her wonderful little hand-drawn emoji. Um, it's, it's, it's super cute actually in close up. It's like a guy holding a frog, but he's wearing a hat that looks like a frog. I don't know where she got this from, but it's adorable. Um, so I'm gonna call her Crystal, which is not her real name. It's actually one of my former students' names. So we'll just use Crystal for this one. And, um, so Crystal's writing this paragraph and I'm able to leave her comments. This is the important part to include in your analysis. Um, what theme, you forgot to put that in your claim. I'm able to leave her that immediate feedback um, for her to respond to. And I know what you're thinking. You're already thinking about the number of students you have and how time consuming it is to leave kids feedback. We're gonna get to that, don't panic, it's gonna be okay. Remember, I was able to like flip through all their docs at once and see who needed feedback the most first. And so I went to those kids first and then caught up with other ones later. That's important too. All right, and we asked the students to reflect on how this first paragraph went. Um, and so uh, this is what it looked like in Canvas. We gave them the cute little emoji uh, Likert scale, but really these were the questions we asked them. How did it go? What would you improve about it if you had more time? Which part was easy? Which part was hard? Tell us about your goals for high school. 
thought you were going to take AP classes or not. That was important to me. I wanted to know that. This was fairly early in the quarter, and I was kind of curious what my students' goals were. Um, now, John Hattie will tell us that asking students to self-evaluate their work is very highly correlated with student achievement. So this is part of that. Go back to your paragraph. Tell me what was easy. Tell me what was hard. Um, they're thinking about their own learning, and that's what I want them doing. Um, so I'm the only part of this that I really care about is the fourth and fifth question. What was hard for you? Um, because that's how I'm going to tailor my instruction going forward. And then I want to know about their goals for high school, because if a student's telling me that they want to take AP classes and they're struggling with this analytical paragraph, I want to give them not necessarily extra support, but I want to give them extra motivation. I want to be able to get to that student and talk to them alone and say, look, I know this writing an analytical paragraph thing is hard. It's worth it. Here's why. You said this was your goal. Let's see how we can support you with that. This is going to help. All right. And then we go through and we evaluate common issues. Common issues we are typically seeing this quarter in our students' analytical paragraphs are incomplete claims. That's not pretty normal. Evidence that's not a good fit for the claim. Reasoning that they are summarizing instead of analyzing. They'll drop in a quote and then they'll tell me exactly what the quote said. Like, I know what it said, I just read it. Why does it matter, right? And then their conclusions introducing new claims. So they'll start off one way claiming one thing and then by the time they get to the end of the paragraph, they're claiming something else. So now we have to teach these things. We're gonna teach into these issues. So to deal with the fact that our students are giving us incomplete claims, we gave them a claim again. And then we asked in Pear Deck, what's the question asking? What two things does our claim need to include? Well, it needs to include a specific technique and a theme. We wanna see if students can come up with that. If we scaffold it for them and say, what are the two things you absolutely have to have? Can you see it in the claim? And we can teach into that. And we wanna teach them to pick good evidence. So we gave them this, I actually have this for you as a Pear Deck slide in a few minutes where you're gonna to get to see if you can answer this question. Um, which of the following pieces of evidence would work in a paragraph that makes the following claim? So if this is the claim, what's the best evidence you could choose that would fit that claim? And then reasoning. We had another passage from the book that we used. We were reading the absolutely true diary of a part-time Indian um, as chosen for us by the district. But you know, in virtual learning, I'm picking my battles. So um, we had two examples of that could be reasoning and we asked them to pick the better one. Now this wasn't hard. The better one was the longer one. Um, yeah, I can absolutely provide a link to this pair deck. Let me grab that really quickly. I'll drop it in the chat again. There you go. All right, and then the problem of students having new information in their conclusions. So we blacked out the rest of the paragraph and showed them here was your claim, here's your conclusion. And we asked them to compare that. We talk about mirroring the claim. So your conclusion should mirror the claim is what we say a lot to students. And they mostly get that. They understand that eventually, but it takes a little practice. And it takes four paragraphs of practice as it turns out. This was another fun one. Um, because we had that issue of students changing their claims sort of halfway through their paragraph, we have this paragraph where we asked them to drag the thumbs down to the error in the paragraph to see if they could spot it. And the challenge here is that the claim is that the author is using repetition, and the mistake is that all of a sudden halfway through the paragraph they introduce hyperbole. So we want to see if students can spot that. All right, here's your chance. Which of the following pieces of evidence would work in a paragraph that makes the following claim? Tell me if you know. Coming through for you? You're just taking your time to choose your answer. Okay. I know it's hard if you haven't read the book. <laughs> All right, you get the idea. So these are the kinds of activities we can do with students to help them understand better the structure and the needs of an analytical paragraph. Uh, we also give them activities like this. Earlier, I was having you highlight what's most important to you about teaching students about writing. Um, so we ask students to practice highlighting claims, evidence, and reasoning um, using their highlighter tool. 
um, as well, so that they get a sense of what those parts are. All right, what are you thinking or wondering at this point? Let's check in, how are you doing? Uh, Marie, if you don't mind me sharing your answer, I'm going to drag this over here and show you what it looks like for me on the teacher side. Um, these are your answers coming in on my Pear Deck teacher dashboard. You might have to look on the Zoom screen to see it um, in case you're uh, able to. I won't scroll down because I don't know what anybody else's answers are and their names are on there and I don't usually show this to students, but this is what it looks like. If I choose to show responses, it will take your names off and bring them up there for the class to see. Um, so this is the Pear Deck teacher dashboard. Um, and thanks to mm -hmm, I can um, I can show you what that looks like behind my head. Usually I keep this sort of off stage uh, where it's not uh, distracting me. And I don't want students to see it when I'm teaching live. It allows me to put a star on an answer if I want to. And that will obviously then that answer becomes the one that shows up when I'm sharing answers. Um, I can also, uh, leave feedback. So I can write some direct feedback to Marie um, you know, and send that to her and she'll see it. And if I want to, I have these little three dots over here, I can hide that student's response. So if I don't want that student's response to show up in the responses that I'm showing the rest of the class, I can hide it there. So that's a little bit of what the back end of Pear Deck looks like because somebody was asking for that. Um, okay, somebody wants to hear more about feedback. We're getting there, I promise it's gonna be great. Uh, Pear Deck is amazing. Um, yeah, I know it's moving fast, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we we're at 3.30, that's good. Um, yeah, uh, somebody who commented that they teach third grade, this is fantastic for third graders. Um, Pear Deck and third graders go together really, really well, especially uh, things where you can drag things. Um, Pear Deck is a premium, a freemium service. There's a free version and a paid version. My district did buy the paid version for all of our teachers because we are fully virtual. Um, the premium version, normally if you just go to Pear Deck and sign up, they give you a month of the premium version. I have a code for you that's gonna get you three months. So even if your district is not buying you the premium version yet, um, and then, um, then you can get that premium version from me. Um, somebody asked about the camera setup behind me. Um, that is the mm -hmm app. I will tell you more about it. Um, it is in my slides and I have a link to you for you to the slide resources and every link I've talked about today will be in those slides as well. Okay. All right, moving on. Feedback, that's where we're going next, right? So uh, we've talked a lot about instruction of those three phases we talked about in the beginning, instruction, feedback, assessment. We're moving into feedback. All right. How are you giving your students feedback right now and how is that going? I would like your feedback about feedback. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, let me show some of these responses um, so that you can see what people are saying too. Um, Google Docs, Schoology, Canvas, comment banks. Comment banks are key. We talk about an option for comment banks, Google Classroom, verbal, yes, very much so. Uh huh. <laughs> Pro Keys, yeah, Pro Keys is about to come up. Um, if you don't know what Pro Keys is, your, your world is about to be shaken. Um, all right. We introduced our students to the concept of analytical paragraph two. We gave them a new text to read and a new prompt. So the new prompt, we tried to make it easier. We wanted to provide a little less support 
We took out the part about a technique the author was using. Um, we thought that the emphasis on that had kind of thrown kids off. We wanted to bring it down a notch. So we introduced this prompt. Um, in a well-written paragraph, make a claim about how Kim's identity has been shaped and support your claim with sufficient evidence and reasoning. Right. Um, so we read this one in Common Lit. There's a link to that in the resource doc that I just shared in the chat as well. Um, and here we're giving, we're amping up the feedback. We're getting, getting more specific with kids about what they need to be doing in their paragraph. And here you can see Ms. Romansky. She gave me permission to feature her comments to kids in this session. Um, and what I want you to notice on this page is the pink part. The pink part is something she wrote. The pink part is a suggested edit. So if you're familiar with using Google Classroom, you're probably familiar with suggested edits. Maybe you don't know that you can turn it on or off in any Google Doc. Um, so let me show you how that works. Up here, right underneath the share button, I know when a student turns in a document in Google Classroom that it is automatically in suggesting mode when you start to leave comments on it. But even if they're not yet in Google Classroom, even if they have not yet turned it in, under the sharing button, there's a little pencil that means editing, but you can change it to suggesting. And don't change yourself to viewing, that'll kind of lock you out of the doc, but uh, you can switch to suggesting. And what that means is that you can start to do this to student documents. You can do a lot of markup um, and, um, and those appear in a different color. The catch is that for every suggestion you make, there's a checkbox, there's a little check and a little X. And what happens is students don't know what to do with that. The X will reject your suggestion and the check will accept it. And I find I have to actually teach students to accept suggestions they like, because what they do is they'll click the X to make it go away, and then they'll go make the exact same change themselves. Like, let me save you some time. Click the check mark, accept it. Um, I want them to have to accept each one of those changes. So that saves me actually a lot of time in commenting. I don't have to leave a comment that says, you need a comma here. I can just put the comma there and it'll show up as a suggested edit. And I can do that even if they haven't turned in their document yet in Google Classroom. I can do it before they get to turning in. All right. The other one I want you to know about is Pro Keys. Now, down there in the corner of my um, slide is a video from Catlin Tucker. If you don't know Catlin Tucker, she's amazing. And I want to shout out a little hat, hat tip to um, my friend Marissa Thompson, who showed me Pro Keys at the California Teachers of English Conference in February of last year, last conference I went to before it was all locked down. Uh, last conference I got to go to in person. So what ProKeys is, is like a comment bank, but it's a comment bank you can completely customize yourself. The screenshot here is all of the folders of different comment banks I have, and I wanna show you what it does. It allows you to type a very short code that you create, and then when you hit shift space, it expands that code. It's a text expander. You might've used them before. So here's what it looks like. I type choice, it says your claim will be stronger when you can claim the author is using a specific choice. I type cap, it says check this for capitalization. I type run, it says this might be a run on sentence. So this allows me to give my students much rich, richer feedback much faster. Um, so if you find yourself typing the same thing to students over and over and over again while you're giving feedback on an assignment, um, I do like ProKeys better than other text expander tools. That's a great question, Judy. Um, I've tried to use other text expanders and found them kind of cumbersome or I forget what I'm doing with them. Um, but ProKeys has really been kind of simple for me to figure out. Um, and um, the person who showed this to me, Marissa, she shared with me her whole bank of comments. And I quickly realized they were useless to me because I hadn't made them myself and I didn't know the codes. And she had a cheat sheet of all the codes and stuff like that, but I really just wanted to make them myself and make things that made sense to me. It made sense to me that if I typed cap, I was telling the students that they'd made capitalization errors. And if I typed run, that I was telling them that it um, would, would uh, be a run on sentence. And so Judy's right, it doesn't show up in the doc, but it does show up in the comments of a Google doc. So um, this GIF that I'm showing you right now is a comment window on a Google doc. I made it by adding a comment to a Google doc. It also works in the comments on Canvas. I use it a lot there. It also works in my web-based email. Um, and so when I get to the end of an email to a parent, I write close, shift space, and it says, thank you so much for asking. If you have any further questions, please you know, don't, don't hesitate to ask kind of thing. It types this lovely, beautiful closing that I don't ever have to type again. It just does it right. Yeah, um, yeah, Marissa's great. Um, so um, Pro Keys, very worth getting. It's a Chrome extension. 
Um, you install it on Chrome and then it works in anything that's web-based. It even works when I'm building Google Forms. Like I just type name, ship space, and it says last name, first name, and puts all that in there for me. Um, so I'm a big fan of ProKeys. Um, I haven't shown it to anybody yet who didn't immediately love it. So it's pretty cool. Um, saves me a lot of time. And you can see from oops, the number of folders I have, those are all pretty full. I've got lots of comments in there. Um, sometimes they're specific to specific assignments. When we write an essay about Casco Amontillado, there's a specific set of comments I use. Uh, when we are writing about, um, I have one that's, one that's email. Um, will it work with, uh, in other browsers within the G Suite? I'm pretty sure it only works in Chrome. It is a Chrome extension. I don't know if there's a, like a Firefox or a Safari version of it, but I use it as a Chrome extension. So, are you not allowed to have Chrome? I feel I feel really bad for you if you're not allowed to have Chrome. Yeah, I know. I got a new Mac and um, it had Safari on it. Safari had one job: download Chrome. Um, all right. Um, I also want to encourage you to consider screencasting your feedback. And I know this seems like a lot of work, but I want you to remember that you're not going to do it for every student. These are for screencasting feedback works great for my really high end students. Um, for my students who are super, you know, high level writers, they're able to understand that feedback. Um, Screencastify is limited to five minutes. If you're giving a students more than five minutes of feedback, they're probably not listening to it all anyway. Um, and you can stop and start it. So like you can be recording, you can read a paragraph, hit record, tell them what you think, hit pause, read the next paragraph, you know, that kind of thing. Um, Loom, I think, is unlimited, and my district did buy us an unlimited license of Screencastify during distance learning. So, but but pause is 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 for the win, right? Um, you can also just read the whole paper and then go back and screencast a couple pieces of feedback. Students like hearing your voice. I wouldn't try and do it on every assignment for every kid. I would pick you know five kids on each assignment that you want to give it to. Um, all right. Individual breakout rooms. If you haven't tried this yet, it is fantastic. <laughs> um, so um, I've heard a lot of teachers say they're not allowed to use breakout rooms or they're not allowed to have a kid in a breakout room with other kids by themselves without an adult. Can't they be in a breakout room entirely by themselves, right? Like all alone. Um, so we do this a lot. It gives our students writing time, but still having access to a teacher. So 27 students in the Zoom, 27 breakout rooms. Everybody gets their own breakout room and a teacher can visit, as teachers, we can visit each one individually. Um, and then there's an ask for help button on every breakout room. So if they need us, they can, like ask for help and we'll come see them and see what they need. So we use this quite frequently, um, sometimes for five minutes at a time, sometimes 10, sometimes 20. It depends on what they're working on um, and how many students we need to visit and things like that. So individual breakout rooms has been a great way to um, keep sort of a rein on our students. So like let them know that we're close. We're also giving them time and quiet space to work. Um, so if you haven't tried that yet, it works great, it looks like this. Um, there's also a link in our resource doc to a spreadsheet that will help you create pre-assigned breakout rooms. If you want to put kids in breakout rooms for deliberate purposes, you can do that with a CSV file uh, before class starts and it's super helpful. Um, all right, individual breakout rooms, bitmojis, kids will do anything. You know, you know the kids will do anything for a sticker? These are the new sticker. This, this is the new sticker, right? Bitmojis. Um, you stick one of those on their paper, they're super happy. All right, uh, another feedback tool that we used recently is PeerGrade. PeerGrade allows students to submit their writing, and I recommend doing this with short pieces of writing, like it works great with paragraphs. And then that writing is automatically sent to three other students anonymously. They give each other feedback within the system, and then they get the feedback that other kids gave them. Um, it works, this is the little bit of what the dashboard what it looks like. We use this for analytical paragraph two. So students were doing peer feedback to each other. Um, they submit their paper and they appear there. They are either giving feedback, reacting to feedback or done. And unfortunately I took the screenshot when most of them were done. So, but that's a little bit what the dashboard looks like for me on the teacher end. So I can tell who's where and, like, and I can kind of drop into their breakout room and say, hey, you know, are you still really looking at your first one? Can we move along a little bit? Or are you playing video games? You know, what's going on? So it gives me a way to keep track of where they are. And then this dashboard, the results dashboard, Let's me see, like, I don't pay much attention to the scores they give each other. That's not super important to me, but I will scroll through the feedback that they give each other. Um, and I will visit their breakout rooms and say, did you get your feedback? How was it? Was it helpful? Did you like it? Um, so that, thank you, Brian, for making live captions available. Um, 
So that kind of thing. So students report that they love this. Um, they see three other people's work and they get feedback from three other people. And those three peers are telling them the exact same thing I would have told them, but it matters because three people said it instead of one. All right. We did not use this in this particular assignment, but I wanna share it with you anyway, because I think it's a great trick. There's a tool called Socrative. You've probably heard of it. They've been around a really long time. You're probably used to thinking of it as quiz, like a quizzes thing, like you just give kids a quiz, but they have this option called a short answer. And with the short answer, you get the, this ability to just send kids one question, just one question. And I send them a short answer text question. I ask them to paste in their piece of writing, their paragraph, their sentence. And then there's a button at the top of all the student answers that says start vote. And when they start the vote, they get back everybody's answer. Every single student in the class all appears on their screen. And then they can, um, no, there's no names on it, it's all anonymous. And I say, you know, who wrote the best descriptive sentence? Who wrote the best piece of dialogue? Find the one you like the most. Find the one that's better than yours. Find the one you wish you wrote, right? So they vote on that. Um, and then we look to see which answers got the most votes. And then we talk about why they are good. So in this way, students are generating their own mentor text. They're picking the best paragraph, sentence, whatever in the class and saying that one, that one's really good. Can we look at that one more? Um, and we do it more than once. Um, so this then appears on the classroom screen. This is actually a picture of my teacher computer when we did this. Um, and it's from a different assignment, you know, Ellen Goodman in her article, Big Brother Meets Big Mother. I think we were working on writing rhetorical pricey at that point. Um, so we look at this one now as a class and often I'll copy and paste it out into a Google Doc so we can annotate it a little better and talk about why was this one so good? Why do you think so many people picked this one? What did this student do really well? When we give that star student the opportunity to reveal themselves or not as they choose, they can choose to remain anonymous. That's also fine. Um, and then we do it again. So write, vote, examine the one that won. Okay, everybody go work on yours for five or 10 minutes and then we're gonna vote again, right? So students love this because they see an immediate impact on their own writing. They write, they see one of their peers writing, they look at exactly what they could do better, they go do it better in their own writing and then they submit it again. So that's a super popular technique in my classroom. I uh, also wanna make sure you know about the Hemingway editor or Hemingway app as it's called. Students paste in their writing and it sort of points out to them places they might need to work on. Um, this one kind of uh, makes it, uh, it's, it's sort of like AI saying, hey, pay attention to this part of your writing. It's really, I don't have to do anything. And just like, before you turn that in, did you put it through the Hemingway editor? And they're like, oh yeah, let me check on that. And, and then, you know, it kind of brings things to their attention, makes them see it in a new way. And I always like things that make them see it in a new way. Having them read it out loud, or if you can get them to read it out loud, that's another way to do it too. I've had students call my Google voice number and read their writing to my voicemail just to make sure they're reading it out loud. All right. So this was our end of course advance, uh, I can talk. End of course survey from the end of quarter one. We, one of the questions we specifically asked students was about the feedback they received. And you can tell from the graph that they really liked it. They thought it was quite helpful. So I um, thought you'd like to see that we're actually being effective there. I actually have an entire presentation on ways to give student feedback. Today, I just focus on a lot of the teacher ways of giving student feedback. Um, there are also like, Peer feedback, we did. We touched on that a little bit. Whole class feedback, automatic feedback. So there's other tools available to you there. Fabulous Feedback Faster is the URL for that slide deck if you wanna go through it on your own and see some of my other feedback suggestions. In the classroom, I'm a huge fan of writing response groups. On Zoom, I'm not such a fan of writing response groups. Um, I, I'm not quite comfortable putting six kids in a breakout room and saying, go read your writing to each other. Just don't think they're gonna do it. Um, I walk out on a lot of silent Zoom rooms. So um, we haven't used this much during virtual learning, but we definitely use it uh, in face-to-face -face learning. I want you to notice something that I noticed about this picture when I was putting it in the slide. Do you see their phones? There's at least three that I can see on that desk. And none of those kids are looking at them. <laughs> they're all reading each other's writing. They're actually engaged in what they're doing in writing groups. And it's not just because their teacher was standing there taking a picture. I don't think they even knew I was standing there taking that picture. Um, but I kind of like that when I realized like they're not even paying attention to their phones. Who are these children? All right, 
How are you feeling now about your teacher feedback options? So this is a multiple choice pair deck question. And I will grab this link one more time and give it to anybody who hasn't joined us yet on the Pear Deck. You can join us there if you want to. And tell me now how you're feeling. Yay. People are feeling phenomenally better about their feedback options. This is great. Let me show you that. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm glad this is working for you. That's the goal. Make it work for you. All right. Thoughts or questions about peer feedback and or formative assessment? Anything you want to ask me that you haven't already asked me in the chat or want to know more about, want me to say it again. Otherwise, I'm going to move on a little bit to our assessment section because I noticed that it is 348 and I promised to be done by four. Uh, Peer Grade is not free. I have a link for you in the resource doc that gives you a three month license. And what I found is it is totally possible to have more than one email address. Yeah, engagement is uh, the third rail of virtual teaching, isn't it? Um, Pear Deck is my fan for engagement because what I haven't shown you about Pear Deck because it would mean outing some of you is that right now, some of you are answering my questions about your thoughts on feedback or formative assessment. But if I scroll down to the bottom of that teacher page, I can see the names of the 29 people who haven't responded yet. Um, and I'm not gonna hold that against them, that's totally fine. Um, but in the classroom, it means I can see the names of the people who haven't responded yet. And um, I do have the privilege of having a co-teacher. And one of the things I can do with my co-teacher, hang on a second, close that, is my co-teachers, can have the option of joining my Pear Deck. So let me show you this. So I can invite a co-teacher to my lesson. So all I do is copy that link, send it privately to my co-teacher, and then she can also see which students are at the bottom of that page and who have not responded to my question. And then she can start to engage with them and say, hey, come on, you're, are you really in class today? What's going on? Um, so that helps a little bit, just a little bit. Other than that, it's just like, you know, I don't know, engagement is <laughs> tricky. Um, which is best for primary? So with primary students, I think the peer feedback option I would use would be the Socrative one. Um, if I was teaching third grade right now, they'd be pasting their writing into Socrative and voting on the one they like best and talking about why it was good and writing some more and, and then doing that over and over again. I, I have, my mom was a, a one, two, before she retired was a one, two teacher. Um, I spent a lot of time in her first and second grade classroom. So I don't, I'm not, I got to admit, I'm not current on the third graders, but you know, my youngest is in eighth grade at this point. So, um, oh, oh, Mr. Mansky says I can call her out for being at the bottom of the list, but now you're not at the bottom of the list anymore. Um, does the peer review app stay anonymous for students? I, yes, it does stay anonymous for students. I can see the student names, they can't. Let me flip back to that dashboard view for just a second because I do want to make sure you get an answer to that question. So um, see here where I have these blurred out. Those are student names. I can see them. They can't. Uh, down here, so-and-so said something to so-and-so, right? I can see who said what. They can't. There's also a flag option. If they get some feedback that they feel is inappropriate, they can flag it and I see it right away. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm with you, Judy. I'm with you. Um, Okay, back to where we were. Okay. Um, assessment, Let's get this part down. This part's shorter, I promise. Analytical paragraphs three and four. Um, this is what it looked like in Canvas when we gave students their analytical paragraph number three assignment. You'll notice there's no giant frame on this one. There is a rubric on this one and it's a Google assignment. So Canvas has a way for us to embed Google assignments within it. Um, and it looks, if you're familiar with Google Classroom, this looks a lot like grading something in Google Classroom. We wanted students to have the experience of a more formalized assessment for their analytical paragraph. We let them write it in their English journal still because they're comfortable in that space. And then we asked them to paste it into this other Google Doc where we could give them feedback. And we asked them to highlight, whoop, there we go, sorry. We asked them to highlight their own score on the rubric. 
So highlight and then put their points in the corner. And then we're using this more formalized Google rubric. We're leaving them feedback. And you can see we're leaving them feedback as comments in the text. Now, notice the icon on this one. It's that same student with a little frog uh, and a little hat, hat right? Uh, crystal that we saw before that we were giving some feedback to earlier. All right. Um, so this is more formal, but we want them to have the experience of a formalized assessment for their analytical paragraph, but we also don't want it to bite them too hard. This is still, it's formative assessment for us, but it feels like formal assessment to them. Does that make sense? Um, here's a better screenshot of that page. It shows up a little bigger. Um, this is my feedback to a different student. And you'll notice here, I'm using pro keys. This one down here, try not to use the first person in academic writing. Rephrase this sentence so the subject is the topic you are. That's a pro key. That is me writing first, shift space, and then it goes right in, right? Um, and then um, down here, this is a pro key fail. Be sure your conclusion restates your claim, redo. Well, redo, shift space, failed on me. And sometimes that has happened in Google Classroom or within this Google grading assignment. You have to hit shift space space sometimes on your last comment or it doesn't actually stick. Fortunately, my codes are close enough to what I was really gonna tell the student most of the time that they don't complain too much, but it is a pro key fail that can happen. And I, I noticed that on the screenshot after I embedded it and thought, oh gosh, should I redo that screenshot? And I thought, no, I need to tell people that sometimes this fails in this way, in this exact spot. spot. All right. Oh yeah, I uh, wanted to know if the students highlight their stuff. Yeah, their grades, okay. So remember I said this was formalized assessment, but we were using it formatively. So I wanted to speak just a moment about my grading categories. Um, the first time we, their analytical paragraph three, we put in the progress category. Very little 10% category in the grade book. The other category is reading and listening, or what I like to think of as the receptive literacies. And our biggest category is writing and speaking or the productive literacies. So we're about to get to analytical paragraph number four. And that one's going to go in writing and speaking. That one's the one for all the marbles. That's the one that counts. But we wanted to give them a practice opportunity with that formalized assessment process and um, give them a chance to um, sort of see what that felt like, redo it if they wanted to, uh, get feedback before we hit them with one that was a little more formalized. So the formal, oh yeah, I forgot I threw this one in there. Um, Another way you can have students self-assess is a Google form. This is a image embedded in a Google form with a multiple choice grid underneath it. Um, there is a link probably on your right-hand side of Pear Deck. There is a link that probably looks like it's broken. But if you click the link at the bottom right-hand side of your Pear Deck, it'll take you to my folder of shared forms where you can make a copy of any form I have that you want um, that, uh, that I've shared there. So I'll give people a chance to click that link if they want it. Three. Two, one, okay, moving on. Analytical paragraph four, the one that we did for all the marbles, right? Um, yeah, the discussion room is coming up at four o'clock. Make sure you join us there if you wanna just talk about stuff. Um, we introduced uh, Zora Neale Hurston's How It Feels to Be Colored Me. This is a prompt that came from the district. The district gave us the text, but we said, you know, this text is gonna go way better if we have them read it informative. Formative is a great tool if you're not familiar with it. It allows me to embed questions in the reading for students to answer as they go. And I get a dashboard where I can see in real time whether they're getting those questions right or wrong. I know right away who I need to intervene with, who needs more help, where, where people are having the most trouble. Um, it is a great tool. It is goformative.com. Um, and let's see, this was the, this was, oh, same kid, Crystal. Um, Here's her fourth analytical paragraph. I don't know if you noticed, but her score on her third one was 11, 11 out of 25. This is her score on the fourth one, 21 out of 25. She's improved, right? She's gotten much better. We're really happy about that for her. All right, how are you doing? I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip that. You can tell me in the chat how you're doing if you really want to. Um, a little unexpected transfer. We asked our students to write letters to someone they felt had shaped their identity um, and this was interesting because after writing analytical paragraphs, their identity letters <laughs> had claims and evidence. <laughs> their identity letters were, you know, their claim was obviously, you are someone who's influenced me. And then they supported that with examples and evidence and things like that. So we had a little unexpected transfer. I did not see that coming. It was not intentional. It was one of those happy accidents that happen sometimes in teaching. I'm not going to pretend like I planned it that way. Um, 
but when um, when kids get a chance to write after they sort of write in the same genre, it's fascinating. And we asked our students to do some reflecting on this. How well do you think your fourth analytical paragraph went? Remember, we asked them to reflect on their first one, and now we're asking them to reflect on their fourth one. And this is some of what they said. And this one is my favorite. There are, <laughs> you notice the word suck stands out right in the middle there, right? I did way worse than I thought I did. I believe that I would get at least a 20 or an 18, not 11 out of 25. I would like to redo it and turn it in for a better grade. I did really bad with everything like how my topic sentence sucks and that I didn't follow my evidence with reasoning to connect the evidence to my claim. I'm going, or to your claim, I'm going to redo this and resubmit it. Maybe I'll get a better grade. The easiest part for me was the conclusion, but the hardest thing was everything else. I think my ability to understand a prompt and write a strong paragraph is pretty poor. So I love this reflection because even though this child is telling me that he thinks he did terribly, he's still articulating that the problem he had was connecting his reasoning and his evidence to his claim. Like he would not have been able to say that two weeks ago. Um, you know, so even though he's bashing his work and, and thinks he's doing poorly, I see great reason for hope here because he's, he's able to articulate what's wrong and he knows what he needs to do. And he's intending to redo it, which I'm fully supportive of, right? Um, this one, um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip to these two. I would say that I can definitely understand prompts a lot better. I think I could improve more on writing paragraphs, but for sure I got better at it. Um, at the moment, I feel my ability to understand a prompt and write a strong paragraph is at a good standpoint. I can construct an analytical paragraph with little to no hesitation. Like she's ready to jump on it. I know we're right at four o'clock. I'm just about done here. It says there's some extra goodies for you on that resources doc. This is another one where if you click the bottom link on the right hand side, it will take you to that um, document. And I, I've dropped the link in the chat a few times, but I can do it again. Um, and that's me. And there's a credit slide and I'll go back to me. And we're jumping to another Zoom room. Am I correct, Erin? Yes, yes okay. we are. So we will close this one out, but in, a, in just a moment, uh, but if, if anyone needs the link again, we have that, we'll put that in the chat. Uh, I just the, I'll drop the link to the resource doc again in case anybody needs that. Okay, wonderful. I went by that, I went by that kind of quickly. <laughs> I a link to everything I talked about. <laughs> and we're, we also, we're going to have the recording on our website and that's also posted. Uh, it's, it's above in the chat and we'll post that again. But I just want to thank you for your presentation. And yeah, wonderful. It was great. And well, please thank you all for being here on a Friday afternoon. I know. Yes, thank you all. And please join us if you're interested in continuing the conversation. I know Jen has a wealth of resources to share as well. So uh, we'll go ahead and close this one out and jump into the other Zoom room and give you give us about a minute to get in there. Okay. I'll meet, I'll meet you there. All right. Thanks, Jen. See you all over there.